Let us pray. O God, our Father, we thank thee that thou art a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. As we are in the midst of the study of church history, we think of the literally millions of prayers which have gone up through the centuries to thy throne of grace where they have been answered abundantly above anything the prayers could either ask or think. And we thank thee that thou art still hearing and answering and thy people are still praying. And we ask especially now as we study this phase of medieval church history with its developments and the relationship between church and state that we may learn what we are meant to learn from these momentous historic episodes and the theology which underlies them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Lecture number nine, the fifth century in the West, the fall of imperial Rome and the rise of ecclesiastical Rome. One, while a missionary church was using Roman roads, languages, and civilizations to Christianize the world, Rome and her culture were collapsing before the barbarians pouring over her borders. You all know that the Pax Romana has been the longest period of uh, enforced peace in the history of the world. There was a time when we were hoping there might be a Pax Americana, but that seemed to have uh, passed. And if so, it makes Rome all the more impressive that she could have produced a forced civilization that embraced virtually the whole of Western era, area. Remember, China, of course, a culture of her own, but it was very little known at that time and no viable relations between the two cultures. But the Western culture, was, almost all of it, brought subject to the civilizing influences of the Roman Empire that made Christianity capable of the rapid expansion that we have been uh, tracing here. But spectacle that it was, and wondrous that it was, it was being brought down by these untutored and uncivilized barbarians who were beginning to eat away at the Roman foundations. And as Rome became weaker and weaker, and they became militarily stronger and stronger, the doom became more and more inevitable. Now, I think we see uh, in the Roman Empire, pagan that it was, a kind of pharaoh, the ancient king of the Egyptians in the days when Israel was in the land of Goshen and was delivered miraculously under Moses. Pharaoh was raised up by God for the specific purpose of bringing him down and showing the strength of God. And in a very real sense, the Roman imperial pharaohs were raised up far more notably than the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, and their being brought down before the veritably impotent Christian church, which survived their collapse and actually subjugated their conquerors, was all the more visible a demonstration of divine uh, sovereignty. As God raised up Rome only to bring her down before the feeble Christian church, which began then to dominate the whole Western world. It seems to me that's the message of the Bible vis-a-vis -vis the fall of imperial Rome and the rise of ecclesiastical Rome. Two, Alaric the Visigoth, pushed by the Huns and later followed by the Huns themselves under Attila, poured into Rome itself and only its bishop could persuade them 
to leave, a dramatic evidence of that because the bishop had no military power. He couldn't possibly have stopped uh, Alaric from the fall of Rome and even less uh, Attila later on. But nevertheless, by persuasion, basically Christian persuasion, these people were turned away and Attila himself, who was called the curse of God, was not uh, allowed to bring his awful curse totally on the center of Christian culture at the time. They, there were other barbarians, I, as I say in a survey course, we can't begin to go into all the detail, but perhaps I ought to mention that uh, later, Odoacer, his name is spelled differently, different places and different times even, and so on, but he, in uh, AD 476, became uh, the, a barbarian who became a Roman emperor and actually succeeded to the uh, imperial status, though it was largely through the influence of the church. And a little later, Theodoric, who was himself a Goth, had become a Christian and ruled well. Rome had been sufficiently decimated that the empire had shifted to Ravenna in the eastern part of Italy, mainly because there were so many marshes around it that it was difficult to be invaded and overcome. But we have the fall of Rome and the prestige of the church surviving that fall that ultimately reached even the barbarians themselves, and Theodoric was himself quite a, a Christian, though he was accused of the Arian heresy. And he was guilty of a um, military murder, but he was accused of heresy, though it looks as if that was a false accusation. But it's interesting, we get to the point where we can have barbarians on the Roman Empire sufficiently Christian that they could even be suspected of a heresy, but that was the case with Theodoric III. Thus began the fall of one Rome, which tyrannized over the bodies of men to be, to be succeeded by another Rome, which ultimately tyrannized over the bodies and souls of men. The, at this particular time, you can't say that it was doing that, but very quickly it was going to claim a tyranny far more extensive and awesome than anything Rome ever imagined. For though Rome did have a politic, uh, religious relationship, it was very tolerant of other kinds of religion and never entertained the idea that salvation would depend uh, on it, though physical salvation sometimes depended on emperor worship and such things as, uh, as that. But we have the new Rome, the ecclesiastical, that's going to become very quickly political ecclesiastical Rome. And when you get that combination, you've got a, a church which actually dominates the nations and the religion of the area and is determining the salvation of the total uh, populace and also ruling that apart from Rome, there will be no salvation. In this period, this expression, extra ecclesiam, non salus est, becomes quite common. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Now here again, you see, I call your attention, class, to an expression which in itself is uh, not only innocuous, but is downright true and beneficial. This is an excellent phrase as it stands. Outside the church there is no salvation. The church is the ark in which the church sails in safety while the rest of the world is being wiped away. There's no salvation except in Jesus Christ and being in Jesus Christ is being in the true church of Jesus Christ. And yet that's a profoundly pernicious expression. Why? Because of what it means. It's a code phrase. 
And it doesn't just mean the church, and it doesn't mean the true church. It doesn't mean the church of Jesus Christ, as we would call it. What it means outside the Roman Catholic Church, dominated by the papacy, there's no salvation. That's a different meaning altogether. And, of course, if the, we understand the Bible correctly, that is tyranny of the most frightful sort, because your relationship to Rome now as a subordinate believer absolutely essential to your eternal salvation. And everybody shared the view in those days that if you weren't saved, you were lost, and that's a truly biblical idea, that you are either in Christ on your way to glory or you're on your way to hell out of him. Extra ecclesium, there's no salvation if you're talking about the true church. But if you're talking about a church which is claiming to be the only church and is not, then it is the ultimate refinement of cruelty. Number four, imperial Rome advanced by the sword and ruled by the sword. Ecclesiastical Rome was to conquer and rule by two swords, ecclesiastical and political. I'm sure you all know that Rome did indeed dominate by her invincible army. And as soon as the barbarians proved that that army was no longer invincible, Rome ceased to rule. You may not have heard this other expression, the two swords theory of the Roman Catholic Church, but you can immediately realize, once you hear the expression, even though you have no idea at the moment what it means, that at least it means this much, it's more than Rome had. Rome had only one sword by means of which the invincible army dominated the Western world. But here is a body, the successor of imperial Rome, which has that sword of a state and also the sword of the church. Now, there are many Roman Catholics today who don't like that, uh, that doctrine and don't share it and are as much opposed to it as any Protestant would be, but I don't think these persons, if they're knowledgeable of church history, will deny that was the classic view, is the classic view of the church. But let me explain, first of all, the sword of the church. The sword of the church was the power to admit or dismiss members. And remember, if membership of the church is essential to salvation, that's the same thing as saying you have a sword by which you cut a person down, you kill him eternally, or you can deliver him eternally. Now, the sword of the state was uh, wielded indirectly, according to this theory, that we will see come to its full realization in the great uh, popes of the Middle Ages that we'll study in the next lecture. That was yielded by the state, to be sure, the church didn't take it away from the state and say, look, we'll handle political, and social, economic issues as well as ecclesiastical ones. They said, no, you are appointed by God too, and you are to do your job, but you do it under our direction. And we tell you when a person should be punished or not punished and how he should be punished or not punished. This is the way in which Rome always maintains. She never put anybody to death even by the Inquisition. She ruled by the church that they should be put to death and the state should put them to death. Directly, the church executed no one, but indirectly, it executed millions of people down through the ages, through the sword which the state wielded, but under the direction especially of the papacy. Number five, there can be no question that political Rome gave birth to ecclesiastico-political Rome. Many scholars once held that Peter died a martyr in Rome after a 25-year bishopric. Hardly anyone believes that today, though Peter apparently reached Rome and died there as a martyr. That is rather generally agreed upon by all scholars, Roman and non-Roman, but the traditional Roman view that Peter was there for 25 years as the resident pope, as it were, is hardly believed by 
anybody uh, today. Now, strictly speaking, uh, it wouldn't be essential to, uh, to uh, Roman theory that the Pope would have to get to uh, Rome to uh, rule there as Peter the first Pope and so on, but manifestly it's a much more congenial idea to have Peter as the first Pope at Rome where, it was, where the papacy was to be established uh, permanently. There are still scholars, such as the man Hoysey, whom I mentioned earlier, who uh, write books on Var Petrus um, Rome. Was Peter ever in Rome? It's still a question. There's so much metaphorical language here that it's hard to, to be sure. But uh, I can say generally there's, no, there's a kind of consensus that Peter did get to Rome but probably only for a short while before he was actually uh, martyred there. But I point out in number six here that there's no question that Rome was Paul's city, twice visited and the place of his martyrdom. And Paul, not Peter, was the New Testament Moses. Paul's influence utterly transcended uh, uh, Peter. It so transcends Peter that, as you know, some scholars will actually call Christianity Paulinism. That's blasphemy, of course, and nobody would have detested it more than the Apostle Paul. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He contributed to the deity of Jesus Christ. He was a servant of Jesus Christ. But he was a servant of such magnitude who wrote most of the New Testament, gave most of the exposition of the person and work of Jesus Christ, and especially in the book of Romans, the way of salvation, that there is no close uh, second uh, runner to Paul as far as influence is concerned, and his influence was stupendous at Rome, certainly, whereas the influence of Peter is dubious at best and short-lived uh, as, uh, as well. But uh, it all goes back, as I say here, uh, where is that? Uh, Number seven, let me read that. I was just going to say it all goes back to a misinterpretation that has thrown Peter all out of line and made his significance uh, far greater than it actually was, though so no one cares to minimize the fact that Peter was a very important leader of the early apostles. But number seven, but Rome, having settled on a misinterpretation of Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and seeing only Peter and not Peter in faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ confessing, had even to find a successor for him, not even mentioned in the New Testament. Those of you who are following my handout notice that I hyphenated that expression. I'd like to read it again for anybody who may be listening without actually seeing the phrasing. What Christ said to Peter at Caesarea Philippi are these words, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now I add to that, and seeing only Peter, and not Peter hyphen, in hyphen, faith hyphen, in hyphen, the hyphen, lordship hyphen, of Jesus hyphen, Christ hyphen, confessing. Peter, as the foundation, they even look for a successor who's not even mentioned in the New Testament. The basic mistake here, it is perfectly true, Christ says, thou art Petras, and on this Petra I will build my uh, church. Now, it is true, Petras is a masculine word, Petra is feminine. As a, as a, there's a, a pun here going on on the word Peter, and there are many Protestants think that's the uh, place where Rome goes into error? I think probably not. I don't think there's much doubt that Christ is saying, you are Peter, and on you, Peter, I'm going to build my church. But the Peter on whom Christ is building his church is the Peter who says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's only that person who is considered as a rock in the church. The same words were used for all the other apostles in Matthew 18 and in John uh, also, and Peter refers to himself merely as a rock in a building of which we're all uh, rocks and so on. Now, there's no denying here that Christ is pointing out Peter as a rock on which his church is built and a leading one, to be sure. But it's only Peter as confessing Christ, the Son of the living God. All you have to do is stand back from that text 
and ask yourself the question, is Jesus Christ promising blank authority to keep people out of the kingdom or admit them in the kingdom to a man regardless of what he believed, whether he accepted Jesus Christ or not, whether he was an arch heretic or whether he was orthodox? Do you think for a moment that Christ would say to a person like Judas Iscariot, for example, who probably agreed with Peter that Christ was the son of the living God, that he should be a rock in the church? That's the thing that's so out of line. And then I just point out the fact that there's no mention anywhere in the New Testament and no Roman Catholic claims it that there was a successor to Peter or there was to be a second. So Peter doesn't have the role that they give to him, judging from Christ's word, and he certainly has never authorized to appoint uh, successors. But once that type of think, thinking got loose in the church and its development took a pace and so on, we reached after a while where the Roman church became indeed the ultimate tyranny of the human soul and body as well insofar as it included the state and the power of inquisition as well. Number eight, and Peter was to become the one to whom submission was necessary for salvation. I'm just pointing out here again that it's in connection with a man who's giving an authority by the church that he was never given by Jesus Christ. That's bad enough, but when that person ultimately becomes in his successors the individual on whom your very salvation depends, then the seriousness of the matter becomes all the more true. Here again, we notice a lesson in church history that keeps uh, popping up through its pages. Peter was a good man. He was a godly man. He was a leader among the apostles. He made notable mistakes himself, especially after being called the rock on which Christ would build his church. You remember Christ then went on to say that he must go to Jerusalem and die, and Peter makes his first mistake as a pope and literally tries to shake sense into Jesus Christ. This is not for you. The Messiah didn't come to die. He came to rule, to conquer, to make Israel a center of the earth, to replace Rome and to become the dominant figure in Egypt, to die. How in the world could you get such a notion of that? This is the erring uh, Peter at this point receiving as severe a rebuke from his Lord a few minutes later as he had received praise earlier when Christ had said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not received, revealed it unto thee, that but my Father who is in uh, heaven. But here again you see you've got a, a good man making a bad mistake and a worse mistake being made about him. See, we attack this interpretation of Peter. We're not attacking Peter. Peter was a godly man. And yet here he was a source of all sorts of ungodliness in his own name, attributing to him a role that he never actually received, which in time developed in something that actually became the tyranny we're talking about. Number nine, once begun, this virtual deification of papacy could not be stopped. The description that Paul gives in 2 Thessalonians about the, that the, the man of sin being in the temple making himself as God applies exactly here. You see, once I become dependent on Peter and his successors for my salvation, Peter is greater than God. The popes are above God. God can't do anything about it. God might want to save me, but it's too bad. His servant has said, you're lost, Gerstner, you're lost, and so on. Now, if any human being has that kind of authority, then, of course, he's above God. God can't stop him. He can stop God. He is in the temple. He's claiming to be God's servant, and so on, man of sin, chief figure, and so on. This seems very strong language. John Paul II is a very congenial sort of person. Everybody rather likes me. He gets along well with people. He's charming in his manner and everything else. You mean to tell me he elevates himself above God? Oh, come on now. That's got to be bigotry or something like that. Well, if he in his chair as Pope actually saw fit to, he could damn any soul or save any soul, and God couldn't do anything about it. Whether Paul, John Paul himself ever does it or not is beside the point. The point is it's in his power, and he wouldn't relinquish that. And even when he was in Geneva, uh, home city of Calvin and the Calvinists, as it were, and so on, he made it perfectly clear a couple years ago 
And however much we discuss reunion with the Church of England and the Eastern Church and the Protestant Church and so on, the papacy is non-negotiable. He would be false to his Lord, he feels, if he did that actually. So that is something which is going to be held to the end according to the present incumbent of the so-called Holy uh, See. But I'm mentioning here in this connection as a, a development that couldn't be stopped once you got that kind of uh, thing. It's not very common today. It's not popular in modern types of thought. The Roman Church is largely in rebellion against it itself. More Roman Catholics think Protestant this way than they do Roman Catholic. But, but the theory remains the same. And wherever it can be enforced, it will be enforced. The Pope has his uh, finger to the wind, the same as everybody else. But the power is there. And we're coming next in the next lecture to a period when that really came into its own. Number 10, how this development came about will be traced in the next uh, handout.